My name is Gavin McClurg. I live in Sun Valley, Idaho. I am 48 years old and I've been pretty intimately involved in athletics my whole life. I grew up ski racing, grew out in Lake Tahoe in Nevada. I made the U.S. ski team when I was 17 and then very shortly after that I was actually heading over to Europe for Europa Cups and then back to the States for some Norams and so kind of the tier right below World Cup and the Olympics uh, it was starting to look at the time that the Olympics were looking pretty good in 94 in Norway and I destroyed my knees. It was actually on the first day of the Gulf War, January 15th, 91. And uh, and then came back the next year, they kind of put you on injured reserve, came back the next year and destroyed them again. And, you know, you're 18, you're invincible, you never think injury, I, I just, you know, wow, you just keep training and you'll be fine. But the surgeon on the third one basically said, hey, Gavin, I know you can't imagine this because you're 18 and stupid, but, if you keep going down this path, um, unless we come up with something that I don't know about yet, by the time you're 30, you're not gonna be able to walk. And so that hit me kind of front and center. And I kind of basically re-engineered my life because it had been nothing but ski racing for 18 years to suddenly think about college and, you know, just doing something completely different. Uh, not necessarily outside of athletics, so, but, outside of professional athletics. So I got really into climbing, rock climbing and whitewater kayaking and became sponsored whitewater kayaking and got really serious into that for a while. And then got into sailing. I, I ended up sailing around the world twice. Uh, that is still my business. I run kite surfing expeditions around the world. Yeah, I spent almost 15 straight years at sea. And during that time got into paragliding and this is almost, I, I call it like my second comeback into professional sports, obviously being 48 uh, and also with the ski racing background, I had never done any endurance racing at all. all. All the stuff I had done was pretty short duration. There's there's kind of a couple different disciplines in paragliding. There's acrobatics and then there's cross country. And I got quite into cross country and got real lucky to, I broke some records and then got involved with Red Bull to do a couple big expedition films for their Explorer series. And I got involved in this race called the Red Bull X Alps. And that is a, they call it the toughest adventure race on earth because it's a 12 day foot slash paragliding race across the Alps. It always starts in Salzburg. And then there's a series of waypoints that kind of take you back and forth across the spine of the Alps and it ends in Monaco. It started in 2003, it happens every other year, and it's just a ludicrous amount of output, basically. it's You can kind of think of it like an ultrathon every day in the big mountains, carrying your pack. You know, you're carrying your instruments and your helmet and your flight deck and your harness and your wing, and you have a support crew. They can feed you and water you and, and uh, help you a lot with strategy and that kind of thing, but you, it's this mix of very intense, endurance racing on the ground and a lot of paragliding and often the paragliding is is not very recreational it's it can be you know you're battling pretty hard, hard weather and wind and it's, it's pretty dangerous and so uh it has an 11 percent finish rate uh, my first one was in 2015 i've done it now three times and i'm getting ready training right now for my fourth one which will be june 2021 COVID dependent uh and so, it was in this journey that i discovered vespa and peter and the ofm yeah and it was it was a really interesting journey for me because i like i said i wasn't an endurance athlete i was always kind of a sprinter i guess you really do have to train quite intensely just for the pack because over the course of the race you know that's metric tons um the, you're allowed to move between 5 a.m. and 10.30 p.m. every day. So 17 and a half hours a day you're moving. And then except one day in the race, you're allowed to call what's or use what's called a night pass and you can go all night. So sleep deprivation is a big deal um, because again, you're not just running or walking or mountaineering. You know, we often have to deal with quite a bit of snow and glaciers and that kind of thing too, but um, you are paragliding, which is sketchy. And so you want to stay uh, safe and that can be 
tough if you're, uh, you know, sleep deprived or you're not recovering fast, you know, if you're just exhausted. So hardly anybody runs. That's an interesting fact of this. You just can't run with a pack uh, days on end. It doesn't, your joints can't ha handle it. So you're just, you're kind of like speed walking, you're just, you're moving fast on the ground all day. And you, you know, because like I said, if you've got 17 and a half hours, that's a lot of time. And so if you're just covering, you know, six and a half K an hour, which is just a fast walk, you're going to cover a lot of ground in 17 and a half hours. And so over those 12 days, I averaged four flights a day and climbed the height of Everest four times. So 120,000 feet of vertical ascent. Uh, most of the flights you use, you got to climb about a thousand meters to get to a usable launch and be high enough to make something of it. So 4,000 meters a day. So 12,000, 15,000 feet a day. It's not very physical to fly. You're using quite a bit of core. Your hands are like this the whole time because they're on your brakes, uh, you know, and, but it's, you're actually, your caloric needs are more than when you're humping it on the ground. Part of the reason it's so important to train really hard for this race isn't just to be injury free for the 12 days and to, you know, have your muscles take the shock load instead of your joints and all those kind of things, you know, the resilience and durability and all that kind of thing. But it's, it's so you can climb mountains over and over and over again and just immediately switch, you know, get to the top, get to the launch, you're unpacking your stuff and you fly off and you need to switch over real quickly. That's what's amazing is because your brain is using, uh, your, your brain is very calorie intensive and flying is intense flying is very you know you're you're calculating constantly everything you're doing um and trying not to crash you're 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 trying to cover ground you're trying to cover it efficiently you're trying to cover it fast and you're often trying to cover it in conditions that are pretty rowdy so you know what the conditions we're looking for are the kind of stuff that makes people scream in airplanes and lose it. You know, when it's really banging around and you're flying an airplane over the desert coming in the land and say Denver Inverna International or something in a hot summer day and everybody's getting tossed all over the place, that's what we chase. How I met Peter was after, in the first race, uh, I lived on goose and gels and Coke and um, it wasn't the plan. I mean, I, I don't, necessarily like that stuff that much and uh but it was more just i just felt like i was on the on the precipice of bonking for 12 days and day three or four of the race my body you know you, you're you're putting your body through considerable trauma right and my body dealt with that trauma by blowing up i just had massive inflammation didn't even really recognize that that's what it was going on at the time but you know like for example I, by day four my feet were two sizes bigger than they had been and so very you know by day two even they were starting to blister really bad by day four i could barely walk and so every morning i'd leave the van and start going and i could barely i mean it was blisters on top of blisters on top of blood blisters i mean this was like somebody had looked looked like somebody had beaten on my feet with a hammer and uh and i had trained you know we had done tons of 60k walks and i had trained for this but i live in the desert in idaho where it's super dry number one and the alps are incredibly humid they were having a big heat wave in that first race in 2015 the first few days so it was raining and it was super hot and it was i just couldn't deal with the moisture and so my feet went to hell i thought because it was more the climate and just the trauma but what i later learned and especially working with peter was it was because I was just eating so much sugar. So I was living on sugar and then day four, because of the pain, I started living on Advil. Um, and so I was just destroying my liver. It just couldn't, my kidneys and liver couldn't handle it. And like I said, it wasn't the plan. I mean, I was eating, you know, massive dinners, just huge before I'd go to sleep, you know, and salads and salmon and good things, but also a ton of pasta and a ton of carbs. And I mean, I, I basically felt like I was starving the whole race. It was just whenever I could, I was eating. You know, I'd have all kinds of gastro problems and my heart rate would shoot through the roof. And so it was a pretty miserable way to live for eight of those 12 days. I mean, after the race, when we got to Monaco, the day after the race, to go to the bathroom, one of my teammates would have to literally carry me 
in their arms to the bat. I mean, I literally couldn't walk. By total luck, I met Peter. Uh, I had heard him on a friend of mine is named Nick Hawks. He's a he has his own podcast, as I do, and it, but his is more mine's based on flying his is based on you know kind of health and he had had peter on his podcast i happened to hear, hear it and he nick knew he followed the race and reached out to me afterwards and said hey i think you need to talk to peter and at the same time uh ben my trainer my coach and also one of my supporters in the race he found a guy down in pocatello which is quite near me it's just a few hours away who's a hormone specialist so i went down to him and we did a ton of blood work a bunch of lab testing and at the same time working with peter on uh basically ofm protocols and using vespa which was something i almost felt like vespa was cheating in the second race. it was unbelievable so i uh i became I don't use any sugar anymore. I mean, I think there's still places in the race where uh, carbs, but not from goose, but carbs are still required and necessary. But basically my approach the last two races, so in 2017 and 2019, I mean, there was no trauma. There was no inflammation. There was no foot problems. Um, and I eat a fifth of what I did in 2015 that's been the big thing i mean i don't eat that much more than my crew than my team i do do some carbs um because you do need it i feel uh, i mean i'm not a nutritionist but i feel but i don't have any of those problems I, I, in 2015 by day three on i would go to bed at 11 p.m and wake up at 4 30 in the morning to get ready to go out the door at five and my bed was i'd be in that much water on each side and it wasn't from rain it was sweat it was my body just trying to dump all this crap basically i guess and that's i mean that's it was it was unbelievable it was almost like i was drowning in my own sweat so not only is that disgusting, it was just really unhealthy. In 2019, we really tuned it in and it, it was just magnificent. Um, you know, I, my body a couple of months before the race was just properly in fat metabolizing mode. Um, and I, my caloric needs plummet. I, I mean, I don't have, so I don't have any of the stomach problems. Um, I'm not hungry and I can just go and go and go and go and go. And so my body's using itself uh, really efficiently. It's insane that that shouldn't, I mean, it's not humanly possible, right? So, I mean, for that kind of output and I'm not eating that much, I mean, it's, I'm eating more than your general office worker, I'm sure. But, um, but like I said, I'm not eating that much more than my crew. And uh, you just get your body t to be super efficient. In the off year, we usually start the kind of serious training nine months before the event. I use Vespa always now uh, for that kind of thing as well, just because it definitely helps my brain. Now the food side of things, that's just a permanent switch. Uh, you know, I, I won't go back there because I, yes, I'm 48, uh, I'm no spring chicken. A lot of the guys in the race are less than half my age um and i'm definitely one of the older ones so for me that's just that's just necessary but i've noticed such a difference in my ability to think process think on the fly um, stay more kind of in touch with what i'm doing is much much better using this protocol so it's just kind of a way of life now it's fascinating i think for me to have been an athlete my whole life in all these years but be stronger than I've ever been now. That, that's been a lot of fun. Like anything, there are no magic pills. You know, there's no secret bullets. There's no silver, <laughs> secret bullets, silver bullets. I mean, it takes time and it takes time to train your body how to adapt and adjust to this. You know, it's not overnight. You know, there are, there are no real shortcuts. Although if there is a shortcut, it's called Vespa, but um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a trigger. It helps. It gets your body into that phase much faster and it works. It, it just, it's, 
and, and it's not it's not hard. It's just a shift. 